Thanks, Matt. That was, oh, God, thank you. All right. Do you guys mind if I, I'm going to wire this up my shirt? Do you, this is what I do like every, basically every day that I have to film Whiteboard Friday, is you run a microphone up your shirt and, or have someone else do it for you. Also awkward. Uh, Matt, I have to say that was one of the more surprising introductions I've received. Um, I, I really appreciate it. I'm not the CEO of Moz uh, anymore. But, uh, but I, so I love to run around the stage. I hope you guys don't, don't mind that. I'm just a, a nervous pacer. I think it comes from my genetic background. I did 23andMe. Have you guys done the 23andMe? It's, it's quite fun, quite entertaining. And I found out I'm like 97% Ashkenazi Jewish, 1% Genghis Khan. That's, that's um, very. He, he got around, him and his family. Uh, so I did want to talk through some failures, and I have a lot to get through. And because I have a lot of slides and not a ton of time, I have made sure that you can get the presentation online right there. I just tweeted that URL as well. Uh, and you can download us bit.ly slash rand intel fail, which sounds like you would get something where I failed at intel, but regardless, OK. And if you're thinking to yourself, Eh, is this presentation going to be any good? Don't worry, the, the URL will be at the end of it, too, if you decide afterwards that you're interested, but not now. All right. So the, we do lots of competitive intelligence tool building at Moz, obviously, right, and data gathering. And I do a lot of it personally and professionally, because uh, this is stuff that I geek out on. And I often help uh, lots of startups, particularly those that are funded by um, similar investors to ours, to do this stuff. And these are the things that I observe time and time and time again. So the first one is that a lot of times when we do competitive intelligence, we assume we know the root cause reason of why something worked or didn't. And I'm going to share a moderately ridiculous example with you, but th that's to highlight the knowledge that we all have and how we need to be careful in applying this. All right, so here we go. We go to, uh, this is a, a search result, right, for help desk software pretty fairly competitive and certainly very, very lucrative industry. Lots of people uh, in these search results making in excess of $10, $20 million uh, a year. And so you might go, OK, we analyzed these you know, 50 of our most important search terms. We looked at uh, the people who are in the top organic results. And we found this interesting correlation, interesting correlation, which is, hey, you know, it turns out that when people are ranking organically, for these keywords we care about, they're almost never in the paid search results. Hmm, that's interesting. And so this has really happened, right? Smart people who are not necessarily smart people in SEO go out and they're like, you know, we've read a lot about Google trying to diversify their results. And so we're thinking to ourselves, hey, maybe it's the case that this is because Google has this preference for diversity in results. And, and, and you can see, right, some, some data around that, that they have become uh, more diverse in the types of results they're showing. It's not just Wikipedia, Wikipedia, Wikipedia in the top three anymore, which is nice. But they then make the, the jump to this recommended action, right? Let's test removing our PPC ads and see if that helps us show up in organic more. It, everyone in this room should, I assume all of the people in this room are going, that's insane. It, it's not necessarily like a totally crazy idea if you're not familiar with SEO, but it really is if you are. And, and I wanted to dig into why that is, why smart people can make this kind of bad decision. I think it's because of a process they use. It's this flawed competitive intel process, and we all do it too, right? We, we collect data, we, uh, we, we go and uh, observe, make observations about data that we see, and then we try and validate that, which is good, right? Through correlation, we, we look how frequently does that happen across how many different search results or how many different times in social media accounts or whatever, whatever analysis we're doing. And then we make a recommendation, right? We're like, okay, look, we saw this, we observed it, we verified and validated that it existed, and now we're making some recommendations like propose an experiment to test this out. This doesn't seem like an insane, terrible process. It, it doesn't, but I think you can be way more successful. We can be way more successful if we do it this way instead. So we'll take the same starting point. Click, click, click. Right, analysis, observation, correlation, and then 
instead of making recommendations immediately, what I want you to do is have some hypotheses. Brainstorm reasons why you might have observed those things and what the root causes are. So for example, in our uh, case before, my hypothesis would be people who focus a lot of time and energy on organic search get really good at it and then feel like they don't need to pay. And so they don't invest in paid search. Rather than, so what I would do to verify that is take a look at those top folks and go to SEM Rush and look at how much do they bid on keywords, right? And how many times? And are they competitive bidders? If they're not, that starts to answer the hypothesis without going to crazy town of removing our paid search ads. And then we can take those and propose solutions, right? Recommendations, things to test for each of the potential causes. If we use this process, I think we'll get way, way better competitive intel. OK, number two. Uh, we oftentimes, I think we all have this bias, right? It's just inherent. This is why brands work so well, because we have bias around things that we're familiar with. We have bias around things that are popular and well known, right? It, it's why if you think of auto insurance, you can probably name four or five brand names. And if there's one that you've never heard of, you will be skeptical about buying from them. And this is why auto insurance companies need to do heavy, heavy amounts of advertising so that you're familiar with their brands and all this kind of stuff. All right. So here's, uh, this is in Open Site Explorer, but you, you could do, imagine this with any uh, comparative competitive intelligence tool around links, right? So I've plugged in four domains that I've seen time and time again around help desk software. This is, uh, what is it, Kayako, Freshdesk, Spiceworks, and Zoho.com. They're kind of top of mind for me. So I plug them in, and I see, wow, geez, you know what? We, we don't just need like, you know, good links and, and sort of good on-page stuff and, and topical relevance and serving customers. Like, we really need a powerful domain if we're going to try and rank in help desk software. OK, except this is a biased sample set. And we do this all the time. We study like the four or five competitors that we always talk about in the office that we're always thinking about instead of broadening our thinking. So I, I actually did this. I went through and I, I only did about 10 keywords, right? But I pulled the domains that I saw most frequently in the top 10 rather than just the ones that show up for like the primary keywords in the top three or four. And these guys consistently show up. And look, look at that. I, that's a lot of low domain authority. I would not feel confident that I know that domain authority is required, high domain authority is required to compete in these SERPs. Maybe you can have a less powerful domain and do well, and you need to figure out more creative methods to go about this. So I, I suspect that many of you are like me, right? We bias to what we know, and so we assume, like given my background in search, I often think if you're doing well in search results, you must be having business success as well. I think many people who've done SEO are like, yeah, actually, we know that's not true. Uh, tragically, tragically. There's a correlation, but not, it's not one-to-one -one by any means. Uh, we, also, we also have this bias to outliers. So this is one of my pet peeves in the uh, startup and investment in VC worlds, right, is that um, in technology, people look at uh, uh, these companies, in particular Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Twitter, right, and a few other ones. And they say, oh, you know, look, uh, this quote from Paul Graham of Y Combinator, I think, encapsulates this, which is, uh, investors tended to be biased against older founders, for instance. The cutoff in investors' heads is 32, Graham says. After 32, they start to be a little skeptical. Fuck you. Like, what? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, like, I think that's ridiculous. You know, what, you know what I love about that kind of bias? Is then you can go look at data and realize that you're an idiot. Because of successful companies, right, companies that have had uh, uh, billion dollar valuations or exits, uh, just about 15% are in that age range. So you have excluded 85% of your founders by looking for someone who, you know, is young and white and looks like Mark Zuckerberg and can't dress himself. Like, anyway, very pet peeve of mine. I get a little passionate about it. But this bias to outliers is something that is inherent in human beings. 
We see a few people, we start to pattern match in our heads, and it makes us dumb when we do competitive intelligence. Right? And that's, that's not the only way to skin the cat. Let, let's imagine a little bit more broad, thoughtful solution. I would encourage you when you're doing analyses like this to cast a wide net, right? Say, I'm gonna analyze our, our big competitors in search rankings, right? Like this is, this is a competitive in, Intel project that you might do. Before you do that, or instead of doing that, I, I would say, let's go analyze a broad range of competitors, right? That aren't just the ones that succeed in search, aren't just the ones that are directly competitive with us, can solve the same problems for whoever our target market is. And, and then we're gonna find the correlations of what predict both failure and success between those. And for example, right, instead of exclusively looking at the, the tactics of top ranking sites, which I know many, many marketers and SEOs are biased to do, like this is just something we inherently do. We look, we look at the top five, 10 of those, and then we go, what are they doing and how are they doing it? and here's a bunch of tools and numbers and metrics, and that's not, a, that's not a terrible thing, right? Like Ray is gonna give you a bunch of those tactics and you sh can and should employ them, but I want you not just to look at what the high-ranking sites are doing, because that will bias you the wrong way. I want you to look at what they're doing that's different from what the low-ranking sites are doing. Correlation gets like a terrible rap in the SEO world. It really does, like it, it, it's weird. In social media, we're all like, oh yeah, what correlates with more tweets and retweets? And what correlates with better financial success for businesses? What correlates with uh, higher employee retention? And those are all fine, but what correlates with higher search uh, rankings? Everybody's like, oh no, stay far away from that. That's terrible. I, I love it because I'm not actually, I I'm as, at least as interested in what predicts that something will rank higher versus lower than I am in what is actually being used by Google to rank that thing higher or lower. Because a lot of times those tactics and strategies lead to the ranking inputs. And we don't have perfect knowledge of these, but we can have very good knowledge of these. So I want to understand how sites that perform poorly in search results could be attracting traffic, could be staying in business, could be doing all that stuff, because that can lead me to other channels as well, and other opportunities. Yes, there we go. I, I have to keep pointing at this one. I'm going to move this over here. All right. So another thing we do in competitive intelligence all the time, overinvest in imitation. We see someone who's having success. We're like, wow, that totally kicked ass for them. That worked. That was a great case study. I'm really excited about it. I'll show you an example. This is the iCoupon blog, and they did a very, very cool A-B test. I thought this was fascinating, actually. One of, one of my uh, favorites. So see that button right there, that big green secure, it's not a button, it's just a logo, right? To say like, this, this site is very secure. Well, they had this idea that maybe that logo was actually hurting conversion. I don't know where they got this idea, but hey, maybe they did some user testing, research, watched people surf, whatever. So smartly, they tested it. They tested it. There's the one right on the, on the right here, no, no big green secure logo. Bam. The page without the shield icon, 400% plus improvement in conversion rate with statistically significant test. This case study is up on Visual Website Optimizer if you want to go look at it. Like, it totally worked for them. I don't know why exactly. Maybe people were like nervous or weirded out by the secure site logo or whatever, but hey, that's powerful. And so like the idiot anti-vaxxer in us might be like, hey, we need to remove, sorry to Jenny McCarthy, but <laughs> she like kills children, right? And so I, I have no sympathy, but, but she's like, oh, let's remove the security messages on our site right away and our conversion rates will go sky high. It's like, uh, no, let's take a slightly more scientific approach with a cartoon princess uh, this is Princess Bubblegum from Adventure Time, and she's like, well, okay, we, we should test this. Like, we can't just go remove it. And then an, an even more intelligent point of view than that would be, is this the most meaningful test we can do right now? Neil deGrasse Tyson, everyone, right? And I'm not saying it isn't, just that we need to prioritize intelligently. Okay, so good, good, good. This is Kayak. Kayak tested this 
in their mobile app. See how they've got this uh, SSL, TLS encrypted payment down at the bottom where, where you agree and book? So they tested removing that because they, they saw the visual outside of your test. And what were their A-B test results? Well, people tended to book less. They didn't just not get the 400% conversion rate, they actually went down. This is why competitive imitation is so dangerous. So, so dangerous. And we all get inspired by competitors, right? We look and I, I think it's one of the strongest things that like, I always used when I was a consultant as an SEO to like, point to competitors and say, look what they're doing, we need to be doing that. And that could really get you know, management's juices flowing. And that's just, I'm sorry, Jenny's, your evidence is no match for my ignorance. Uh, the two problems with this approach are one, that you don't know for certain why or whether a given tactic works. So I might have a hypothesis. The iCoupon blog, not a very well-known site, right? And so if people are not thinking about security while they're looking at a brand that they don't know, that's probably a good thing. But when you get to Kayak, they want to know, right? There's, this, there's like a, a, a bigger population of more savvy users. They're already brand familiar. And now they are thinking about things like security and is that there and is it good? And so it helps them. Maybe, we don't know. And the second big problem with this is that when you copy a competitor's strategy, you will always lag them. You will always lag them, right? Because you're not, you're not innovating, you're not leapfrogging, you're just chasing. So finding this stuff is interesting. Seeing why it works is interesting and useful. And it can be applied, but if you chase a competitor's strategy, you'll always be lagging. And that leads me to number four, the final one, when you underinvest in your own unique strengths. And I see this time and time again with business after business after business. So that, you know, you start with this question of like, what's our competition doing? And then you get to this, this huge broad field, right, of all these different things that potentially you, you might look at. So, you know, we're gonna go check out the help desk software folks and we're gonna see, oh yeah, they're uh, doing these four. Facebook, SEO, PPC, display, and television. Are those the ones we should be doing? I, maybe they are, but I, I think that's a terrible assumption. I think we should do these things because our competition is doing them is a terrible way to do logic. I do think this process is very valuable. Just that last logical leap is invalid. So a better question, the question that I want us to ask is what's something we can do better than anyone else? What's something our organization can do better than anyone else? And what are tactics that are actually gonna resonate and reach our audience? And, and what's the intersection? What can we do right there in that overlap? And we can learn a ton by looking at competitors because we can find tactics that overlap with our strengths. So for example, let's say that we're really, really good at uh, unusually great at creating visual content. Like we just have, you know, we have great uh, uh, visual designers on our team, maybe we're great at comics or we're great at photos or whatever it is. Cool, let's go look at all the tactics that we could potentially invest in, see which ones play to our strengths, and then ask the question, well, two questions, which of these channels is actually gonna reach our audience? And number two, Who's great at this stuff? And what are they doing to succeed? Because now we have the intersection of what we're great at, what our customers are, uh, where we can reach our customers, and we can figure out how to succeed in those spaces by learning from the people who are great at them, who might not even be our competition. Uh, so I'm, I did an example of this uh, recently for um, a presentation on, on local. So if you wanna see some like, analysis, competitive analysis in this fashion. What I did rather than um, taking like a specific set of local search terms and saying who's good, who's succeeding and winning here and why, I tried to take local dominators from across the board and look at the interesting things that they did. So you can check that out at, at bit.ly slash local dominators. And you can get this whole deck, including all the links, right there. Thank you so much for having me.
All right, that was good. Um, when Sarah Bird, our CEO, has a talk with me later today, I'm sure she'll, uh, I'll need a drink for that. <laughs> what, what did I do? No, she's my longtime boss. Um, this is a good um, dichotomy between Rand's presentation and what Ray's going to present because Rand and I swim in a lot of data. We read a lot, we see a lot of data at Moz, we have a lot of conversations about where the industry is heading or where we think Google is heading. But in, in Ray's case, one thing that you will find is behind a lot of the best SEOs in the world are world-class affiliate marketers. And the reason that that is, is because you really need to have those tactics dialed in in the trenches on the ground to be able to, to win in your affiliate marketing spaces. So where I think I'm probably a weak SEO is I'm, I'm not day in and day out grinding through competitive affiliate marketing and in competitive industries. And so I think that having Ray discuss um, her tools and her tactics and what she's focused on in 2015, um, I, I know I'll be taking notes and I think that approach might work for a lot of people that are, that are doing SEO on their sites day in and day out. So without further ado, don't be babbling anymore, let's bring up Ray Hoffman. I'd have worn something more flattering if I was going to know I was going to be out from in front of the podium <laughs> the entire time. Um, so my name is Ray Hoffman. Uh, I go by Sugar Ray online. I'm a career affiliate. I've been doing this since the late 90s in the nonprofit sector and since the early 2000s in the commercial sector. I also own a company called Pushfire. I have a really smart partner that does PPC. Um, and one of the things that I do is try and create strategy for companies um, in order for them to be able to go out and create a point of difference and actually survive and search in 2015. Um, if you attended Greg Bozer's session earlier, you probably saw him say that there's no way in tweaking your way out of the panda and penguin algorithms. Um, you kind of have to accept the fact that, that Google's somewhat won. Um, the problem with that is, and so this is basically to represent Google's algorithm, right? And so if you've been at any of the sessions uh, earlier today, you've heard that you know there's correlation, causation, and then you've got citation rank, trust flow, um, supplemental index, panda, penguin, mayday, pigeon, um, hummingbird, I can't come up with all the animals, it's like a zoo. Um, and so when you ask Google, what are, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do to be able to rank? Um, Google says that the answer to that is this. Um, and so this is what Google would have you believe, that if you just create good content, um, a magical unicorn will carry you over the rankings rainbow and fairy dust will fly. Um, and I just don't believe that the answer to this is purely that. Um, and so, so the, you know, and if you talk to people, I, I, I come across tons of people that wouldn't know SEO if it bit them in the ass and they're creating good content, um, but you know, they're a blogger and so, they heard the tagging things are really good. So they have 27,000 tags on their blog that has 4,000 posts. Um, you know, and so they're creating this magical, good unicorn fairy content, but they're nailed by Panda. Um, so just creating good content isn't enough as much as Google likes to spit that out. Your competitors know that. This is always like my used car salesman type, um, you know, and, and Ian Laurie had said in his session earlier that one of the biggest things we hear at agencies, and it's the truth, is they'll be penalized um, and they'll ask us, well, my competitors are XXX. And so most people that are penalized, this is what they picture the rest of their competitors doing because they still rank in the SERPs using way shittier tactics half the time than the person who got penalized. Um, so spam does still work. I'm definitely not saying that. Please nobody tweet that Ray's like, Google's won, there is no spam. Spam works, like it still works amazingly well. Um, I still put up sites just to see how far I can push things. The problem is, is that spam does not have longevity. Um, we used to joke back in the day that the difference between a black hat and a gray hat was a black hat didn't bitch when their site got burned. Um, they just went and, and you know, took the, put the next site up. Um, so it's very important to realize that when I'm talking about these tactics, I'm not saying that spam doesn't work. I'm saying that if you pay your mortgage with your website, or if your client pays your salary with their website, um, then you kind of have to be focused on strategies that you're gonna be able to implement long term. And that list basically gets shorter. I think Google's guidelines now say that if you breathe on your website, it's spam, um, and they're gonna penalize it. So 
we get kind of paranoid, right? Like you're, you're basically, it's like nobody wants to talk about anything. You can't see it real well, but do you see John Mueller up there on the right? Because he's like kind of imagining, you know, that Google's watching his every move. Um, next time I'll bring the transparency down a tiny bit. Um, but so basically, it's like we, we've all become kind of paranoid, right? Because it's like Google's like, don't do anything. As a matter of fact, I saw there was a webinar recently where John Mueller was like, you know, I wouldn't build links. And I was thinking, well, you know, in the real world, um, links are what ranks. And so, you know, it's kind of like Google doesn't want to say they want us to create all this great content. Because at the end of the day, Google doesn't care who ranks. If there are 50 sites that sell bicycles, they do not give a shit which 10 sites are in the top 10 as long as they're good sites. So whether or not Joe's getting penalized with his bike shop is of no difference to them as long as Jack's result that appears in the top 10 serves a good end experience to the user. Um, so if they can do a tweak that's going to pull, let's say that you have a, a SERP and there's 10 results and six are great sites and four are spam. If Google can implement a tweak that's gonna make eight of those sites great and two spam, but it's gonna, it's gonna obliterate three or four really good business owners that didn't deserve it, they'll do it. Because at the end of the day, they answer to their investors. So the, the theory of, of don't build links is kind of bullshit, but the theory of build links, you have to be really careful. Um, I, I, by the way, I'm winning the contest of who can curse the most on your stage, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, it's Portland. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I mean, it's, so it's kind of like, well, what do you do? What is it that we can do? And you know, Google's answer is nothing, or they come after us like this. Um, if you ever have read my blog, you'll know that I, I constantly say Google's like Skynet. It was funny, I did a search for Skynet the other day in image search to get this image, and one of the suggested like groupings for the images was Google. Um, so I was like, even Google knows their algorithm is uh, Skynet. Um, but so basically, now that we know that Google doesn't really want us to do anything, um, how do we do something and look like we're doing nothing except serving the end user? Um, and so a lot of sites are running around like John Connor. They're really scared. Google's getting ready to take them out, and they're really paranoid. And my answer is that you have to become Sarah Connor. Not like Sarah Connor the mom, but Sarah Connor the badass, who basically was like, I've got to figure out a way to to take them out before they take me out. And in this context, it's more of you have to figure out a way to develop um, defensible links. And I, I hate that term, and it, it's been around for a really long time. Um, but it's the truth of what we have to do. Because like Ian said and Greg said in the prior session, um, as long as you're going up against that line, Google will change what is OK. Um, and there are no apologies and there are no recourse once they decide to change what's OK. Um, when they first came out with nofollow, there was a thing. And, and if you were in Greg's session, he talked about a specific newspaper who I'm also going to allow to remain nameless. Um, but so basically, if like Leonard Nimoy died today, um, and so this newspaper would shut off all of the links on their homepage and everything would go to the Leonard Nimoy story so that it would rank really high when people were coming in. Sculpting, if anybody's heard of that, basically that's what they would use it. Um, and then Google basically, Google said, oh, sculpting's fine. It wouldn't be the top of our list of what we do, but it's fine. And then they decided it wasn't fine and started evaporating page rank. Um, at one point in time, Matt said, quality guest blogging is good, and then it was all guest blogging is bad. Um, so. This is a bullshit mantra. Um, I just believe you need good content to rank. Do not get me wrong. Um, but saying that content is king, uh, you can produce. There's, I, I used to own uh, one of the largest sites for Blackberries on the internet. Um, and we had gotten this leak of a new Blackberry that was coming out. Nobody was supposed to know about it. We got pictures of it with a, a basically the guy didn't want us to publish it until X date so it couldn't be traced back to him. And the day before, the number one competing site to us broke the same story. And so we were like, oh my god, like they already broke it, now it's not news. Except they relied on the fact that they were the big dog in the space. So of course, in Gadget and all those sites, we're going to pick it up from them because they were the big dog. So we immediately launched the next morning and sent out all the emails. Um, and we were who got all the press because they just relied on their great content um, rather than actively going out and promoting that content. Um, so I tell people that there are two types of content. There is the content that you want to write um, and the content that your target market actually wants to find. Um, and they're not always the same. Sometimes you want to write the top 10 things that George Hamilton can teach you about. I don't even know who 
Is that a beetle or, okay. <laughs> um, great, now I'm that person that didn't know who Paul McCartney was. Um, but so it's, you know, you, you find all the catchy stuff, but the question is, is that really the content that's gonna resonate, resonate with your target market? <laughs> and so, and it's kind of like, because everybody in here is probably like, oh my God, she is going to talk about content marketing. I will punch her in the face if she says to do content marketing. Um, and I have a post on my blog where I say that content marketing to link building is basically what an escort is to a hooker. It sounds prettier, um, but essentially at the end of the day, everybody's looking to get laid by Google. Um, so content marketing is the, the way to do that and kind of, you know, feel better about yourself, and you're not just trying to get links. Um, so then we had the rush of top 10 reasons X. Um, basically, everybody took the BuzzFeed model, which works great for gifts and when shared on Facebook, but tried to apply it to everything. So it's like top 13 things that stockbrokers can le learn from Walking Dead. Um, and so you've got way back in the day, who's, who's old enough in the industry? Um, I'm not asking your ages. Who's old enough in the industry that they remember Dig? Okay, so Dig was um, a social sharing site where basically our goal as marketers, a lot of people misunderstood it as just bookmarking your site on Dig to get a link. And what we would do is we would put together an article and we'd get it on the homepage of Dig. And all the people that read Dig were all tech nerds that had blogs, so then they'd all blog about it and that was how we would develop links to, to stories. The problem is, so we had a site, I owned a site at one point that did credit cards. Um, shocker. And so we did an article on like the, the top nine most ridiculous credit cards. So there's like a Hello Kitty credit card. I don't know if you know that, but so we did this article, got on the homepage of Dig, got all these links, got all this traffic for the day. But the problem is, is that the top is BS content marketing. And so that's, you got a story to go. It went really, really high. It flew around the web. Everybody talked about it. And as soon as it was over, your traffic went right down to the same level. Why? Because you weren't reaching your target market. You were just looking to get in front of anybody. Um, whereas if you have a story that goes, God, TV has made me hate the word viral. You ever watch TV shows and they're like, it went viral. Um, so the, the difference between, from, to me, is if I can see this as a human being in my analytics, you damn well better believe that Google can see it. Um, and so if you get something that pops to your target audience, then in theory, you will keep some of them as users. Not all of them. Nobody expects you to be anywhere near the peak but your traffic should see a tiny bit of a bump when you're done. Um, so I always look at content marketing success. You hear about that a lot. And, um, when you work with larger brands, you'll often work with brands where there's a different department controlling the blog um, than the SEO department. And we'll have the bloggers come back and they're like, it got 5,000 retweets. I don't care. Um, as, as far as content marketing success, I look for increases in traffic that are coupled with increased sales, increased conversion rates, um, increased time on sites, increased average order value, reduced bounce rate, increased list signups, we will talk about that later, and increased brand searches. Um, way back in the day when we used to, I, I've been on, I, I've worn every color hat there is. Um, and so back in the day when we, when we used to blog spam, the, there's no other way around it, um, we used to blog spam and Google finally had figured out all of a sudden we were getting 10,000 links overnight and we weren't ranking anymore. Um, and it was really frustrating and you'd get a site like when JibJab first came out, I'm aging myself there, um, but when JibJab first came out, like they were all the rage and they got all these links overnight and they were fine. And so a group of us were kind of like, well, what the hell is the difference between JibJab getting 100,000 links overnight and our spam sites getting 100,000 links overnight? But the difference is, is that when you actually become something noteworthy and something worth sharing and something worth visiting, is that people are also talking about you. So in, in, in our opinion, we think that it was coupled with the fact that Google had the toolbar, so they knew how many people were actually visiting the sites versus, you know, in, in correlation to how many links it got. Um, how many people were actually typing in jibjab into Google all of a sudden because they were hearing about it because it was being talked about and not just being linked to. Um, so for me, content marketing success is I can, I can go into any one of your sites, any industry. I can go to an accountant site and put together a page that's the top 10 sexiest accountants in America, and I can get that a crap load of traffic, but you're not going to get any customers from it. Um, and so that is one of the biggest things that I tell companies when they work with content marketing companies is don't just look at the traffic. They need to show you a hell of a lot more metrics than that they were just able to push people through the door. Um, 
So as far as how to figure out how to create the type of content um, that Google is looking for and the kind of content that's a little bit more defensible. Um, and so Rand and I, he, he said don't duplicate your competitors because you're always going to lag. And so I agree with that to an extent and I'll, I'll get to the, the caveat for that in a minute. Um, but so I went, I figured you wouldn't mind. I play on my site too, so. Um, but so if you go to, this is Raven Tools. Um, this is their inside, inside their pages tab. Sorry, it's cut off a little bit. Um, you can type in any domain name and it will pull back what it believes are the strongest pages to that site. And one of the reasons that I use this tool is because if you have competitors, and like Rand said though, don't limit it to just the top competitors, but go and look at what people in, what, what the competitors in your industry, what are the strongest pages on their site? Um, because you're gonna find the obvious stuff, but you may find, um, you know, in Maz's case, they have two pages on how to learn SEO, um, and those get linked to a lot, and those are really strong pages for them. Um, so if I were somebody that was, and this, this was where I kind of laughed when I built it, because I was thinking, if I was somebody that wanted to compete with Maz on the term, um, but it, it, it'd be kind of hard to do that in this instance. Um, but you can look at what competitors in your industry, what type of content they're putting out, that is being well received and that is being linked to and that is being considered authoritative. Um, and ask yourselves two questions. You know, one, can I recreate that but better? Um, the but better is very important. Um, and the other question is, one of the things that I like to do is on top of looking at, and this applies to everything that I'm gonna show you here tool-wise, but on top of looking at what my competitors are doing, I will go to completely different industries. So we teach search marketing. I might go to a blog that targets small business owners or a blog that targets general marketing or public relations and pull up their strongest pages. And what types of ideas have they had that I can twist and apply to my industry that hasn't been done in my industry yet or hasn't been beat to death in my industry yet? Um, so. Once I go ahead and pull that page that I think is doing what that looks like, it's authoritative on their website. Um, I'll go to SEMrush, and it's fine. You know, this is this is actually a really good tool. And I'm going to tell you a lot of the tools that I'm going to show you uh, cost money, and this is just the sad fact of life. You have to pay for tools. Um, we we are just at a day and age where if if you value your time at more than 50 cents an hour, um, you have to pay for tools. Um, now keep in mind though, because we have I have a lot of smaller companies that'll ask me like, you know, well you're talking about all oh, these tools are $2,000 a month. I don't have $2,000 a month. Then segment it. Do all your keyword research in March and pay for SEMrush in March or, you know, et cetera. Just make sure um, that you're using the tool to the fullest. You know, larger agencies have the ability to just have the tool running all the time. Um, but if you're looking to, to um, if you're a small team looking to be as cost effective as possible, keep in mind that you can do things in batches so that you can get use out of these tools without breaking your bank. Um, but so I'll go in here and I'll look at the organic search positions. And so what this does is I'll type in the page. So now I know that this page is a strong page on their site. So now SEMrush is going to tell me what keywords it believes this page is ranking for. Um, so it's great to know that his Learn SEO page is ranking, but what type of traffic is that, that drawing in? Obviously it's drawing in how to learn SEO. Um, but what other type of traffic that th is that drawing in? And then the other thing I'll do, you'll see the column that's actually, how did you do that cute little, is it that? Oh, um, so that column right there, you'll see that it labels the CPC, which is what SEMrush guesses um, is being paid per click by advertisers on the term. So not only can SEMrush give you some insight into what other terms those pages are ranking for, but it can also give you insight into whether or not they're profitable terms and whether or not those terms actually have any monetary value. And in a second, I'm going to show you how you can correlate that to a content marketing campaign. Um, actually. I'm going to right now. Um, so I did a post on finding the money keywords, and that would have been an hour-long presentation in and of itself. Um, so it's at sugarray.com 18938 for anybody that can't see that. And so basically I detailed out an entire post how where if you are going to do a content mar marketing initiative, one of the problems is, is that you'll go and pitch it to your boss, right? And you're like, okay, so I've got this great idea. And your boss is like, great. What are going to be the results? And we work in SEO, so we know, like, God, you're like, I hope we're going to get results. Um, but also knowing how much money you can spend, how much you can budget on things. So there's ways that you can do, do what I just did and then basically say, well, 
how can I, how much money can I spend on this initiative to create my learn SEO guide? How much are the keywords and the traffic that are being driven to Rand's page? Um, just to give you an idea of how valuable the piece of content might be before you actually spend the time, money, and energy to replicate something um, that isn't actually going to drive revenue. Um, because it may drive SEO benefit, but it's gonna drive SEO benefit over the long term. And if you do three initiatives and spend money and have nothing to show for it in terms of sales, you're gonna have a hard time getting money for that fourth initiative. Um, this is Link Research Tools. This is a really pricey tool. Um, I almost dislike recommending it because of that. The cheapest plan is $9.99 and then it jumps to $400 a month. So this is definitely for smaller agencies and SMBs. This is something I would recommend. You do everything you can at once <laughs> um, and then go, go back to it when you need to again. Um, but so one of the things that I can do to also find content, types of content that have been successful is Link Research Tools has a common backlinks tool. And so basically what I can do, and in this instance, I typed in Moz, and then I typed in my site, Sugar A, and then I typed in my agency site, because my current, my, my personal site is a decade old, my agency site's only a few years old. Um, so this will basically tell me where, where I've got right there. So basically I'm telling it that I want to see sites that have two links in common, where it links to Moz and links to Sugar Ray, but doesn't link to Pushfire. Um, and the reason for that is, is I want to find, A, the sites that are linking to my competitors and aren't linking to me, but I also want to know why. Um, what is the content that the people on those sites have found worthy enough from both of our companies to link to? Is there another piece of that puzzle I can add? So if they have the Learn SEO article linked by Rand, and then they have the Learn Affiliate Marketing article linked by me, is there a possibility that if I write a how to learn pay-per-click article that I can contact those people and say, hey, you know, I already saw that you had these two pieces of content. This is highly complimentary to that content. But again, it needs to be content worthy of sharing with them. And I know nobody likes to think they have an ugly baby. Like everybody likes to believe like that their content is awesome, but like it needs to be awesome, awesome. Like if I only gave you one favor, it was the only favor I was ever gonna give, give you, would you use that favor for that piece of content? And that, that's kind of the way that I think about it when I'm, I'm creating something that I hope to be able to get a, a good link out of. Um, so, but this is, I, I love this tool, highly recommend it. Um, and then also to find what good content has worked for sites. So this is BuzzSumo. How many people in here have used this? Okay. Um, so BuzzSumo, you can go in and type a top level domain. So in this case, I put in sugarray.com just because I'm not trying to advertise me and Moz to you guys. I just didn't want to put anybody on blast. Like, <laughs> um, so, but I put in sugarray.com and so what this does, and here's the caveat. Um, and this is why Rand said, don't always make assumptions, because I'm gonna give you, I've changed URL structures on Sugar Ray eight times now. I do it just to see what the search engines do with it. Um, so since this counts social shares, and since social shares don't migrate, um, this is actually an inaccurate list for Sugar Ray. And that was kind of, when I looked at it, I was like, there's no way that was the most popular post. So as, as Rand said, don't, don't always assume. That said, this does show you the current most popular post based on my URL structure, the new one. And so you can see that the number one most shared thing on my site is Parents Guide to Instagram. I actually wrote that because there's a shocking number of parents that don't know how to watch their kids on social media. Um, and you can see that it'll show me the Facebook shares, the LinkedIn shares, Twitter, Pinterest, Google Plus, total shares. This is what content people want to share. Um, this is the content that people actually want to see. Um, and so whether or not it's getting a lot of quote unquote links, um, this is content that will get my brand spread, sp spread. This is content that will get people typing in jib jab into the search engines. Um, that Instagram guide, I have a ton of people that type in Instagram and Sugar Ray um, in my uh, on-site search box. Don't ask, I don't know why. Um, why they do it when they're already on my site. Um, but so you can pull these up and you can get content ideas. And again, you can do this for adjacent industries as well, for industries that aren't your direct industry to see what they've pushed that's done really well. The other cool thing that BuzzSumo will let you do um, is so one, let's say that, like Rand said, see where your audience is. So your audience is on Pinterest. You can sort this so it'll show you the most popular posts on Pinterest. The other thing that you can do is back there where it says view shares. So again, this is where the content is king bullshit comes in, which is, you know, 
the only way that you're a performer, I use Carrie Underwood because I like her, um, is if you have an audience. You can be the greatest singer in the world, but if you're singing in the shower, nobody's going to know and nobody's gonna, it's not going to help you at all. Um, until you actually have a stage to perform on, nobody's going to know how great your content is. Um, so you can click on the View Shares button, and this will show you who, this was my Instagram article, this showed you who shared it. And I can sort it by the page authority of the domain that they list in their profile. Um, you can sort it by domain authority followers, retweet ratio, reply ratio, average retweets. And so you can actually sort this to be able to see who to market your content to. So if you see that, that my parents' guide to Instagram got really good traction, well, maybe you want to go and do the parent's guide to Twitter or the parent's guide to Pinterest or what have you. These are the people that you would market it to. Um, so, and I, I wouldn't suggest repeating that because the parent's guide to Instagram does not drive money. Uh, <laughs> um, but so this kind of lets you see what other people are sharing and know who it is that you're supposed to contact and know who the influencers are. Um, so does anybody watch Parks and Recreation? Okay, so. This is, this is not that many people, okay? So y'all need to get better TV tastes. Um, so he's kind of like, like he, he uh, what would be the word that you would use for him? I don't know, but this is a totally a quote that, that he used in the show. And it says, at the risk of bragging, one of the things I'm best at is riding coattails. Behind every successful man is me, smiling and taking partial credit. Um, and so Greg in his session had talked about parasite SEO. And so he had said, you know, that there were people that would put spam up on sites and then they would drive links to that spam and they'd rank because of the site's domain authority. I propose that you do parasite SEO, but a little less shady. Um, so in this case, this is a cert for small business SEO tips. And you'll see you got, you know, your, your one random guy at the top who actually sells SEO. The majority of the rest of these sites do not. They're, they're sites that target people who would be interested in small business SEO. Um, Entrepreneur.com, smallbusinesscomputing.com, constant contact. So they've already proven that they have the domain authority and the power to rank on specific, you know, on this specific keyword. Um, so my suggestion would be to contact all of these and, and see if there's a way, and, and again, I'm talking from an SEO perspective, but this works for any industry. Um, contact the, I hate to call them hubs because it's a really crappy term, but contact the, the, the authoritative sites in the industry that already rank for these terms because here's, here's what this says to me. These people take content because this is not their core topic, right? So this content came from somebody and it didn't come from them because it's not their, their core topic. So somebody else, and if you go through and click through, you'll find that yes, other people wrote it. So the question is, what can I write for them? What, what can I convince them to let me post on their blog or post on their news site, et cetera, targeting these same terms so that I can flip out the current result for the result that I wrote? Um, because basically, Google's already decided that these domains should do well for this term. I just need to prove that the art, I need to be able to write an article and prove that the article that I wrote is the one that should be ranking in place of it. Um, and so, you know, the, the first thing that, when it comes, oh, sorry. That's got like a really bad lag. Oh, I broke it. Okay, well, we're gonna go to that slide even though it's not ready yet. Um, but so, one of the things, well, it's after the next slide, I'm sorry. Um, so when I say authorship lives, so authorship came out and everybody was like, oh my God, we gotta do authorship. And there were some people that were like, authorship doesn't matter to, to ranking. And other people were like, authorship is the second coming of Google+. Plus. Um, and then there were other people um, that basically didn't feel like, you know, that, that, that basically tried to dissect everything that Google said about it. So Google was like, oh, we don't use authorship currently in the search results, but if you were logged into G+, it did offer auto your search results. So everybody tried to pick it apart. But basically, there's a lot of instances where we give, Google gives us schema markup, and they're like, mark it up, mark it up, mark up everything so we know what it is. What it is. And authorship was one of those, authorship, that was one of those markups that they gave us. And so Google wanted to understand the concept of authorship. And so they said to the SEO community, hey, there's this cool thing, and it might increase click-through rates. And so the entire SEO community goes out and starts marking everything up with authorship, and they start pitching it, and agencies came up around, you know, amplifying your Google Plus authorship. And then Google said, no thanks, we're not gonna use authorship, mark up anymore. Um, there, there is a very distinct thing there that you need to realize is that they said authorship markup. 
because we did their job. We gave them the data, we showed them how to connect the dots, we showed them how to cross-correlate, and now they don't need our markup. They don't need it. They, we, we gave them the blueprint to figure it out without us telling them anything. Um, and so I, I always joke that um, my son plays football, and so you can always tell the, the kid that really loves the game, right? Because that's the kid that's outside doing batting practice when it's not an official baseball practice. So you have the kids that show up and dutifully do what they're supposed to do because they're in baseball. Um, and then you have the kids that are practicing every spare second that they get because they love the game and they love playing and they want to become a better player. So Google says, well, authorship, we're, we're taking it away. We're not going to use it anymore. And so all of the people trying to game the system go, next tactic, and pull back from it. And all of the people that are like, well, no, I'm just, I'm really trying to promote my business, so that's why I'm going to blog on X site, because I want to be able to, to reach their readership. So it's kind of like they get all of the half-hearted you know, players that just show up to play the game off the field. And what's left is this kid you know, basically showing that he has a love of the game. Um, so for me, you know, I, I truly believe I truly believe um, that authorship is alive and well. I just don't think that Google needs us to draw the dots, connect the dots for them anymore. And so then somebody's going to tweet and be like, I should have raised on stage telling us to guest blog. Um, and what about Penguin? And so if you are doing it right, if what you're doing is trying to replace those high-ranking articles in the SERPs and access not only that, their audience, the reason that they rank well is because they're entrepreneur.com. Does anybody in here? How many people in here are agencies or work for an agency? So if you have the ability to get an article on entrepreneur.com and they say, but we're not going to give you a link, how many of you are still going to do it? Because it's entrepreneur.com. And so you're going to get traffic and you're going to be able to say, as seen on entrepreneur.com. So it's the same types of things. Guest blogging, ignore Matt's talking about 400 word posts that are in between breast augmentation and Viagra on a WordPress site. And some that are done a little better than that. I, I may have done some better than that. Or the types that, that Ian pointed out you know, with the guest author bio. But if you're doing it because there's actual traffic and branding to be gained, or in this case, because you can take a SERP that's going to be really hard for your agency to get by flipping out with an authority, flipping out the article being shown on an authority site. Entrepreneur doesn't care which article of theirs is being shown. All they care about is that they're in the top 10 for small business SEO tips. Um, so that's basically my opinion about, you know, Penguin, fuck Penguin. Like, I, I just do it. Don't ask for the, if you're that, if you're paranoid, don't ask for the link. Just don't get the link. Just put your domain name in there. Um, not that, you know, your domain name being seen on the web without a link counts. Um, so, and then I just want to end this quickly. I don't know where I am on time, so I'm sorry. Um, but with mobile, how many people in here have a mobile responsive or mobile friendly site? That's good. Quite a few people. How many people in here don't? Okay. There's like, a, there's at least a third of the room that didn't raise their hand on either one. Um, so Google has been telling you, if you go to a lot of conferences or if you watch the videos from conferences or you read the live blogs from conferences, Google has been dropping, you know, and, and Bing goes, us too, after they say it, but Google's been dropping for like a year, year and a half now um, that mobile is coming and that like you guys need to be ready for mobile. Um, at one of the SMXs sometime in 2014, um, Matt had said that by the end of 2015, mobile was going to overtake desktop for searches performed on Google. And so that meant by the end of 2015, more of the searches performed on Google were going to come from a mobile device than desktop. And that number's never going to flip back. That, the, I mean, that's it. It's, it's never going to flip back. And you would be surprised how many people either don't have mobile or mobile's on the to-do list, but you know, first we've got to fix this, this, and this, and then maybe by 2016 we'll be able to get around to mobile. And so Google's been doing things like, we launched a mobile-friendly badge, and ooh, we really want you guys to be mobile, and we've slightly implemented a, a mobile-friendly portion of our algorithm. And so we as SEOs tend to like, cross the street like a squirrel. 
So it's like, we'll hear that like something needs to be done and we're like, gotta get mobile. Oh wait, no, there's something else. No wait, gotta get mobile. No wait, there's something else. And you end up, I was gonna put a picture of a dead squirrel, but I decided against it. Um, but you end up getting, you know, if you, if you do not just take decisive action, look both ways, there's no cars coming and crossing the street. If you just run out into the street and then react to everything that comes at you while you're out in the street, there's a high likelihood that you're either gonna die or somebody else is gonna die swerving to avoid hitting you. Um, but so Google actually came out, uh, I think it was yesterday, and said April 21st. And so they said, starting April 21st, we will be expanding our use of mobile friendliness as a ranking signal. This change will affect mobile searches in all languages worldwide and will have a significant impact in our search results. Now let me tell you that they have not labeled the majority of their updates up to this point as significant. Um, so to me, it's like there's been, there were like 20 announced versions of Panda, and I think there were two that they said were significant. Um, I don't know about y'all, but there were quite a few more than that that were significant for people I worked with. Um, so this is something that they're, they're point blank saying is going to be significant. Um, and for those of you that don't have a mobile site, it's kind of like, I don't know how long it takes y'all to build a mobile site, test it, and launch it. Um, but I, I would make that what you start working on tomorrow if you don't have a mobile site. Um, so you need to be responsive or mobile. I do not pretend to be the end-all, be-all mobile expert. You will have to listen to the chicken or egg debate about whether you need to be responsive or, or serve up device-specific content. Um, but you need to, so let's put it this way, either of those is better than not doing one of them. Um, page speed tool for mobile user experience grade. Um, and then the mobile friendly test for a mobile friendly approval. Do not ask me why, because I didn't build these tools, but it is possible to pass one and fail the other. Don't know. Um, the other thing is to uh, make sure also, if you guys are doing the mobile friendly test, Google also came out and said that they do not want us blocking access to CSS and JavaScript. Um, we had a client that kept failing that mobile friendly test, and it turned out that they were blocking those two files. When we unblocked those two files, they suddenly passed. Um, so that is something that's going to drag you down if you, don't, if you restrict access to those. Um, and then you guys need to, it's not enough to just be like, okay, we're mobile, we show up pretty on an iPhone. Um, you have to work on conversion, bounce, you have to work on all the same metrics on mobile that you would work on desktop. Um, and again, desktop is never gonna be bigger than mobile again. There might be some new version of a desktop, but desktop as we know it today is never gonna be bigger than mobile. And so this is a true story from, from a client that we work with that is a really big client. Um, in the last year, 17.21% of their desktop traffic has moved into being mobile traffic. So in, seven, in, in one year, 17% of their traffic has flipped from desktop to mobile. Um, and mobile is now at, at over 50%. Um, assuming it maintains even half that growth rate year over year, it means that their mobile traffic should be at about 67% by 2017, I think it'll be higher. Um, I, I think I'm being generous there. And their mobile conversion rate is 0.23% compared to 2.43% on desktop. So this is a company that threw up, and they have a mobile version of their site, but they threw up a mobile version of the site and said, we're done. Half your traffic comes from mobile, so half your traffic is converting at 0.23%. And we know that you have the ability to convert somewhere around 2% at minimum, um, but they've just put no effort into it because they look at the desktop because they're at work in their office viewing their computer from their desktop every day. And I do think there's some industries that are gonna see this more than others. Obviously, um, businesses that are local are probably seeing a way higher percentage of mobile traffic. Businesses you know, that, that sell shoes you know, might be seeing a lower percentage of mobile traffic. Um, and so this kid right here, write down his username, and I called him a kid, I feel so bad. He's, I don't know, he's not a kid. Um, he's younger than me, which everybody's a kid if they're younger than me. Um, but so uh, Justin Briggs is a guy that decided mobile was gonna be a thing before the rest of us were willing to admit it was a thing. Um, and so he's got a few years on most of the rest of us as far as app search, things along those lines. Um, and so I asked him, I said, you know, what would you, you know, would you recommend that businesses put together an app, um, you know, in addition to the mobile friendly, mobile friendly site. Um, and he had said, you know, first make your site mobile friendly, then design an app for your most engaged users. Um, 
An app's not gonna work for every site, but if it is something that would work for your site, I would highly recommend that you start wrapping your head around how to get it implemented. He has a lot of great stuff on his site for developing mobile apps um, and how to deal with app search. Um, and then the last thing as far as audience development, because this was a really big thing that I, so like Rand had said that, you know, a lot of people get really good at SEO and they're like, screw pay-per-click, I don't need pay-per-click, I'm SEO god. Um, I can rank for any term I want to. And so a guy named uh, Derek Halpern, uh, really big into email marketing, and he had said to me, because I didn't have a list on the Sugar Ray site, and he was like, how the hell are you not collecting emails? And I was like, Psh, email marketing. What is this, 2001? Like, I don't do email marketing. I rank for anything I want to put up. And he goes, yeah, well, what happens if Google bans Sugar Ray tomorrow? And I was like, I guess I'd still have, you know, I'd have some traffic from social. And he's like, yeah, he's like, if my site gets banned tomorrow, I have 100,000 people waiting to receive an email from me. Fair enough. Um, and I think in, in where we're at today with Google, we work so damn hard to get traffic from them. Our first goal needs to be when people land on our site is keeping that traffic for the long term, regardless of what Google decides of our site in six months when they arbitrarily change their guidelines again. Um, and so the quote that he gave was, <laughs> if you're not building an email list, you're an idiot. Um, and he markets at socialtriggers.com. He does a lot of psychology marketing. And when it comes to selling things to an email list, there is nobody that I would listen to more than him. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, Sugar Ray is my website, Pushfire is the agency, Facebook is kicks in the ass, and Twitter is lots of foul language, and my football team is the Bucks. They suck, so I bitch a lot. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ray. Um, that was awesome. We have 10 minutes for questions, so I think we have somebody with a mic over here. OK, that one. So if nobody has one, I have one for RAN. So you do a lot of SEO testing with iMac Labs and things like that. Things like, can you get a link in, can you get something in Google's index with a tweet and you run tests like that? If you're a marketer, and I, I love watching these tests, if you're a marketer and you're either in-house, you're running sites, how, how would you interpret that data? Like you wouldn't interpret it necessarily as gospel, like we should go make sure that we get indexed based on tweets or we should lean one way or the other. Do you suggest using those results to test on your own clients or sites? Like, how would you as a marketer interpret the results of this? No, I mean, the, so the way I think of iMech Labs and a lot of the tests that like SEOs like us do is that we're, we're trying to discover interesting leading indicators uh, for the industry and from a broad you know, perspective. So when Google, for example, Google says, hey, on April 21st, uh, mobile is going to become a much stronger ranking factor. And as soon as you said it, I leaned over to Matt and I was like, I don't believe it. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I kind of, I, I think that they will do a little bit, but I think what they're saying is significant is totally in their self-serving interests. Oh, they want a faster everything mobile, uh, they say is in yeah, their self-serving yeah. interests. Right, so I, I think that if it provides a better user experience, they'll do it, but I don't think they'll, I do not think they will hurt user experience to change their ranking algorithm to bias more strongly or less strongly. So I, 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 what I love being able to do then is having like Mozcast, right? And seeing, oh look, we, you know, over these 10,000 search results from April 20th to 22nd, did, how much of a change did we really see? Oh look, it was way smaller than the Panda 7 update. Well, but you're, you're also assuming, too, that like when you were saying, well, I don't think they'd hurt user experience. I don't think they'd hurt user experience either, but I don't think they give a shit about Joe's bike shop. If it's not mobile and Jax is, Joe can hit the road and Jack's going to go in its yeah. place. To um, totally agreed, so long as they think Jack will actually have a better, you'll have a better experience finding Jack than Joe. I slightly disagree. I think it's so long as they think they can make more money off of Joe's user experience, the user experience, whether Joe's there or Jack. The yeah. Combination of the two. Yeah, so I think the way, to, you know, the way that I would uh, interpret those tests is like, for example, Twitter. Uh, so we showed in the last time at Labs example that uh, a URL can get indexed if it's shared on Twitter and nowhere else, not touched through anything else, right? But, and so when you hear Google say, look, we don't look at Twitter at all, which they had been saying now, obviously, they've changed and they, they made their new announcement about the integrated partnership coming. But you can kind of call BS on that. Um, 
for example, we, we just performed a test. Don't tweet about this yet, Eric will be pissed at me, but we just did one where we were trying to see if just visiting a URL via Chrome would get it indexed. Um, answer, sure looks like it. Yeah. So I when Google so. says, oh, we don't use the user behavior from Chrome to influence search rankings, my, you know, I, I'm just so skeptical. Right? And I think that's what's great about doing these types of tests. I wouldn't urge individual organizations to test that way. I would do what Neil deGrasse Tyson did, said, right? Like, he didn't actually say this, I said it, but I put the words in his mouth, which was, is this the most significant, important test that we can do now? Here, here's the other thing, too, on, on just since we're on the topic of, of whether or not Google means what they say or, or things along those lines. You all have to be very careful, too, when you listen to everything that comes out of their mouths. And I'm not saying, like, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that Google purposely lies. Um, I, I don't think that, you know, and, and I know a lot of people that do think they do. I personally don't think, you know, that there's this big lie machine um, that they're focused on. But keep in mind that, like, you've got John Muse kind of stepped in to, like, take over for Matt, right? And Matt was doing this for a really long time when the industry was a lot smaller. There weren't blogs dissecting every word that he said and every inflection of his voice. And so he kind of got to figure out along the way how to be real freaking careful about what he said. And I, I don't think that John's learned that yet. Um, so I, I think a lot of times, you know, you'll, you'll hear con contradictory information um, from the same source. And so just kind of keep that in too, that I don't think Google intentionally tells us a lie, um, but I think a lot of the times their silence can be purposely misleading. Um, so I would just take everything, you know, like the HTTPS is a ranking signal. I think Google would like the web to be secure so that other sites are no longer receiving referral data. Um, and so their way of pushing it is to say, hey, SEOs, we're going to give a ranking boost. And all the SEOs are like, oh my god, S HTTPS, all the things. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind, too, that they do at the end of the day. You know, they have their own interests, and they do kind of think of themselves as like the web Jesus. So I think like 90 days before this announcement, Pierre Farr said mobile wasn't a ranking factor. So if you stopped your mobile strategy 90 days ago because he said that, surprise. But that's why you can't be the yeah, squirrel crossing exactly. the road. You have to do it because it makes sense and not because, and not constantly be changing direction because of what Google says. Right. Great. Other questions? Yeah, it's one the way, way back. Hi, Mark. Hey, Mark. Yeah, so the question for anyone who couldn't quite hear is, what's the sign of a good versus a bad test, a test we should listen to versus shouldn't? And, and I think this is uh, uh, the case. This is one of the reasons that I'm such a big proponent of performing tests and then putting them out in the public and saying, hey, gang, please go tear this apart for us, right? So I, I get somewhat frustrated when, for example, a test is published and then people say, well, it's wrong for these reasons. No, no, it's not, it's not wrong for those reasons. It's just those are good things that also need to be investigated. That, that is our peer review process, right? We don't have scientific journals in the SEO field. We have blogs and forums and Twitter, and, and that's what we should be using those for, is to pick holes in those, uh, tear them apart, find the valuable uh, nuggets, and then uh, give feedback so that we can learn more things. And hopefully, we're building a culture where we all test upon each other's tests. So you see, hey, I'm at Glab said uh, tweets can get indexed. Now I want to see if whether Google's partnership means that tweets can uh, help me rank higher, or tweets can uh, impact personalization behavior, or you know, these kinds of things. And so you can perform those tests or suggest those tests to other entities that do it. I, I'm not a huge fan of saying this, these criteria determine a valid uh, usable test and these don't. I think they're all signals that we should add up together and then do our own work. I think it's hard too from a perspective of, you know, like there, there's somebody that likes to run a lot of tests that I follow on Twitter. And so they'll tweet out a link and go, nobody clicked that, it's a test. And I'm like, there's, there's at least 10 jackasses that clicked it just because you told them not to click it. Um, so I think that like one of the things for me is if you've announced the test before you've performed it, then I pretty much assume that somebody's going to try and taint. You'd be surprised how many trolls are on the internet for like no reason. So. Like the old SEO contests, 
Do we still run those? Oh, yeah. Those are always fun. Oh, man. We what should else? do one of those again. Yeah, let's see a contest. <laughs> what could go wrong? Uh, other questions? OK, I have a question for Ray then, because we do have three minutes. So you wrote, I'm going to butcher this, but you've written it on your blog before, which is like paraphrasing, Google doesn't want to make you a superstar. Google wants to display superstars. Like Google doesn't want to be like, you're the king. Like We're crowning you. They, they want to figure out, you have to get there first. And so you put on your slide in here, like a lot of the content marketing successes is ROI, conversions, money, traffic, like all those things, bullet points. So when you're starting a site or working for a client, when you're doing competitive intel, where do you start? You're obviously not going to be like, we're going to do SEO first. Like, you kind of have to build it up. Where do you start? No, no I, like, I, I would actually disagree there, depending on what you, you think of as SEO. Um, you have, I'm a technical SEO. So when I hear SEO, I think technical things. And then you have marketer SEOs, where when they hear SEO, they think, you know, going out and running initiatives on, on content marketing and stuff. Um, from my perspective, like I absolutely want to fix the technical SEO first. Like if I'm launching a site, if it's my site, then it's probably pretty well SEO'd when I launch it. Um, but it's kind of like like I explained to people that like your website's kind of like your ship and your your links, branding, content marketing, whatever whatever we're calling you know Google's I love you. Um, that's kind of your sale, and so it's like you can have all the wind in your sail you want, but if you have giant holes in your hole, you're going to sink either way. Um, so for me, it's definitely a technical SEO and making sure that that, that is how it should be. Um, I think that I definitely go into part of what Ram was talking about on what competitors are doing um, and what they're also doing wrong. So not just what they're doing right, but also seeing what it is that could be weighing them down like an anchor. Um, I also think, and this is not depending on how many agencies are in-house, and I've, I've said this to a couple people privately, and I know this isn't going to make me really popular uh, with my fellow agency friends, um, but I think one of the big things from an SEO perspective is at this point, I wouldn't recommend that, that I would recommend that people start pulling their link building um, in-house because I think that Google has made the bar so hard or so high. Um, you actually have to know the topic and give a shit about the topic and care about the brand and be able to also ensure that, that you know, the, the product or company isn't tearing apart the work that you're doing. Um, I, I really think people are going to have to pull it in-house. So from my perspective, one of the big things when people contact me and they're like, okay, so we need links to these 10 pages. I'm like, first off, 2005 called, they would like their SEO strategy back. <laughs> Um, and then the second thing is kind of like, you know, people need to change that mindset, but even for the ones that have changed that mindset, they're basically like, well, what do I do to build links? Well, the first thing is, is like, you can't look at it as building links anymore. You can't give me X thousand dollars a month and get five links back. You can, spam still works, um, but I wouldn't recommend doing it if you losing your traffic means you're gonna have to fire, you know, your three employees. Um, so I think for me, when I'm looking at from an SEO perspective, is there any way in hell that you can take this in-house? And if you don't know what to do, hire somebody for the strategy portion of it and implement it yourself. Um, because it just works so, like the best campaigns that I've seen in the last year or two are campaigns that were started by people that were genuinely like passionate about the brand. Um, and there was this, did y'all see that lawyer that made like the Carlitos Way commercial? Which one? So there's this personal injury lawyer in like, I think it was Savannah, it was either Savannah or Atlanta. And so during the Super Bowl, not this past one, but the one before, he bought the entire two minutes locally. So it was just locally, like, you know, in his geographical area, but he bought the entire two minutes. And he produced the most ridiculous, like, mob movie, Carlito's way. Like, there were things exploding, and he was hitting people with axes. And he, it was this whole storyline about how his brother had been shaken down by some judges, and his brother died. So now he was out for revenge for the people. And he was, like, you know, the personal injury attorney of the people. And this guy got covered everywhere like the fact that he did that was just so ridiculous and so like you're talking HuffPo like major newspapers all across the country and this guy is like unshakable now for whatever his term is personal injury whatever the city is personal injury attorney and it was because the guy was just like how do I make everybody in town know my name I, I don't think that he foresaw that being a he was looking at how do I make something ridiculous and make it so that I'm a household name and I think it was Savannah um, 
And by actually having that passion behind it, he, I, I think some of the best campaigns that I see are people trying to push their businesses and not necessarily trying to push links. Build links. Like and I, I, and I think that in order to one, I think, I think you would have to pay me so much as an agency to, to get that involved in your business that it's just smarter to hire one, two, three people in-house and do it yourself and just consult with an agency to get strategy. I thought one of the best points that you made in your presentation that I wanted to, I actually emailed myself while you were uh, uh, talking, which was you mentioned that cert branded search volume plus something, so uh, I think for you it was like Sugar Ray and Instagram, uh, that that was a potentially interesting ranking signal. Um, and I have a strong suspicion you're right, and I'm going to try and confirm it in this year's ranking factor. So I emailed myself to be like, hey, can we look at things that rank and then do they have branded search volume for like brand plus keyword? So like Moz SEO, does that correlate well to our rankings in how to do SEO and learn SEO and that kind of stuff? Well, um, and I, I think if you can't run like a big giant test like Moz with all his, yeah, his yeah. Dr. Pete resources. <laughs> um, but I think, I, I think one of the other things you can do to kind of look at that on a small, much more informal scale is also to type in whatever your brand is, space, and see what pops up after it. So when I type in, you know, my brand, a lot of what pops up is like link interview, you know, as I forget what it is now. But um, so that lets you know kind of what Google thinks your brand is associated with as well and if, if they've made that correlation it's probably because they legitimately see that you can learn a lot about yeah. what Google's and I, thinking about your brand I mean I think that is what you should do largely in place of a link building campaign right how how do I get the result where lots of people are searching for my brand plus this thing because that will predict shares links visits uh, engagement all that kind of stuff. And, and just to like, I know this all sounds very unicorny, like, you know, we're up here hugging kittens and stuff. Um, but it, I mean, you, you do still need to build links and you need to build traffic. It's just that what... You have I think, to do it indirectly. Yeah, I, and I think what, what it, exactly. And I think, you know, uh, I forget if it was Greg or Ian, but they basically said, you know, these, these algorithms are only going to get better. Um, so whatever you have that's slipping through the cracks today will probably be caught a year from now. Um, so I would just recommend that y'all really look at ways to, and I, again, like as an affiliate, it's just a counter nature to me, like build your brand. Um, but I, I think that you have to go out and, and do things in your space that make you stand out. Point of difference. I have a post from 2007 where I talk about that, and you had mentioned that of figuring out a way that you can be better at something, anything. What is your point of difference from all of your competitors? And that's what you kind of have to build your link building campaigns around. Yep, agreed. Um, big round of applause for Ram Ram. That was a great session. <laughs>